1957, we opened the Marriott Twin Bridges Hotel. Three months after the opening, it wasn't doing very well. So my father went to my grandpa and said, uh, you know, I'd really like to run this hotel. Will you give me a chance to do this? And my grandfather said, you don't know anything about hotels. And my father said, neither do you. And so my grandfather let him become the first general manager. So 57 years later, we have 3,800 hotels in 73 countries and some cities you probably never heard of. Today we have 18 brands. I was talking to somebody at my table this morning who didn't realize that one of our brands is Ritz-Carlton. We have everything from Bulgari, Ritz-Carlton, JW, those are our luxury brands, then the regular Marriott Hotel and Resorts brand like we're in today. And then we have a lot of select service brands, courtyards, um, Fairfield Inns, uh, Town Place Suites, Residence Inns, Spring Hill Suites. So we have the best brands in the business, but we really are grounded in people and believe that they're our best assets. And it's not our buildings or our physical products, even though they're beautiful, but it really is our people that gives us the success and they make the difference. For example, our general managers stay with us an average of 24 years. The competitors' general managers stay an average of four years. So we know just from that that our culture helps retain and attract the talent that we have. So having a vibrant culture is also proven to increase the stock price and raise shareholder value. <clears throat> our business success all starts with our vision and our core values. Today, our strategy for success starts with our vision, which is opening a <clears throat> opening doors to a world of opportunity. Um, we just had um, a study uh, commissioned on Wall Street that, uh, where we asked them to assess our weaknesses and our strengths. And they said that one of our strengths was our culture and that that gives us our competitive advantage. So culture, as you know, can be hard to define. So we came up with five core values. These are our values that we can measure our success against. Um, core values, as you know, are basic beliefs that are not compromised over time. And as you know, culture changes depending on what country you're in, but these beliefs should always stay consistent and always stay the same. So I'd just like to share them with you one by one. First, and the most important to us, is putting people first. If you take care of the employee, the, <clears throat> the employee will take care of the customer, and the customer will come back again and again. We also believe in pursuing excellence to give the best service and guest experience possible. This is one of my favorite stories. <clears throat> it's called Joshi the Giraffe. There was a family that went to Amelia Island to the Ritz-Carlton. They had a little boy whose favorite stuffed animal was Joshi the Giraffe. When they got home, they discovered they couldn't find Joshi. So the father called the Ritz-Carlton and they said, have you found my little boy's giraffe? He's really distraught. They called him back about an hour later and they said, yes, we found Joshi in the laundry. He was tangled up in the sheets. So they promised they would send him back. They didn't just send him back. They took him all around the resort. <laughs> he had a massage. He sat out by the pool. He helped the security people monitor the cameras, and he got to drive around in the golf cart. Um, so they put this book together, it was pretty incredible, with a little note to the little boy saying, Josh, he's fine, he wanted to stay a little bit longer and enjoy the resort, he was on a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> and so the father was so impressed with this, he put it on Facebook and it went viral. And that's what we think is serving with excellence. <clears throat> we also believe in acting with integrity. How we do business is more important than the business that we do. And every year, for the last 18 years, we've ended up being um, listed on the top 100 best companies and ethical companies to work for, and we're very proud of that. We also believe in embracing change. We talk a lot about innovation, and we have to be nimble, and we have to reinvent ourselves. Um, I don't think we give ourselves enough credit, because over the years, we have had everything from restaurants to cruise ships to theme parks, that's Bugs Bunny up there, where we had a theme park named Great America, um, to a huge food distribution center, and now we are solely a lodging company. <clears throat> we were the first to have a rewards program and the first to have a different brands where we started with the courtyard 30 years ago. Um, we are known as being a very consistent company, and you know if you walk into a Marriott hotel, you can probably predict what the decor is going to look like, what the food, what's going to be on the menu, 
And so embracing change has been, um, people think it's been hard for us, but if you look at our history, we really have done a good job over the years reinventing ourselves, otherwise we wouldn't be here. We also believe in serving our world and um, we have a spirit to serve culture. We want to leave our communities better than how we found them. Um, six years ago, we bought a million acres of rainforest in Brazil and we help support the villages there so that they don't have to cut down the trees. In China, we started a nobility of nature program where we help support the beekeepers there so that they don't um, create industries and pollute the headwaters of the Yangtze River. We buy the honey from them and put it in all of our hotels in China and keep them going over there. So it's been a really neat project. So even though many things have changed in our business, these values that I just talked about will never change and they're at the bedrock of our culture. I've had the job of Global Officer of Marriott Culture since October. This is a photo of me and my brothers. It was taken about two years ago. My brothers and I have all worked in the company in some form or, or, in some form or another, and uh, my brother that's sitting next to me on the left is named Stephen. Um, he passed away in June. He'd been very ill for many years, and he had this job before I had it. <clears throat> he. Um, had a progressive illness that left him blind and almost deaf and the last five years he couldn't, he couldn't walk and uh, he came to work every single day and made a contribution and he really embodied the culture and I'm really honored to be able to take his place in doing this important job. Um, <clears throat> some days though I wake up and I pinch myself because I can't believe I have such a wonderful job. I get to create a job that will preserve the legacy of my family and their business. And I'm really honored to be able to do this. So I thought, well, where do I start? What should I do? So I started by thinking about what are some of the challenges that I see coming down the pike for our culture. I see that these challenges, there's some more, but these are the main ones, global growth, relevancy to the next gen traveler, um, new leadership, and a widening gap between headquarters and operations. Okay. So growth is a challenge. I mean, you, you've seen how fast we've grown and how many hotels we have, and it's great for bringing shareholder value. It's uh, something that <clears throat> Wall Street loves, the stockholders love it, but it's a challenge and a threat in some ways to our culture. Um, I'll use China as an example. We will have 70,000 relatively new associates by the end of next year. The average age of those um, associates is 24 years old. Now they've grown up in a society where there was no culture of service or, um, or luxury. They also had a, a culture where the bosses are allowed to become tyrants, which is totally anti our culture. So how are we going to inculcate our culture in some of these far-reaching countries with a totally different culture than the American culture um, and keep our culture alive and vibrant? Um, I haven't quite figured that out yet, but I, <laughs> we're working on it and I'm really proud of a lot of our general managers in China at our big properties, our expats, who have worked for Marriott for a long time and that's one of the ways that we're teaching our associates what we're all about. We also have a challenge of being relevant to the next generation traveler. Over 50% of our customers right now come from Gen X and Gen Y. They think differently and they travel differently. They're all about technology, having a purpose, and they're not loyal to their careers or their brands. I think the statistic is that the first 10 years after they graduate from college, they'll have six different jobs. They also view travel as a commodity. So they're all about, you know, where can they get the best deal and they're not loyal to a brand. So we look at this as a real challenge. So one of the things that we've done, that's the basement of our corporate headquarters. My husband's in charge of our architecture and construction. He has a thousand projects going on all around the world. Um, we found all this space in the basement. It used to store all the law archives, and now that it's all digitized, we came up with 7,000 square feet. So he started a lab, an innovation lab down there, where we have <clears throat> um, walls and beds and everything moves, and it's made out of styrofoam and paint and, and uh, two-by-fours, and it's really cool. 
And uh, they all go down there and they play around with rooms. And they've totally redesigned some of our rooms. And uh, we have had six, 700 people come through from the outside to critique them and to do surveys and to do research. And I think you'll be surprised when you see some of the new rooms being rolled out. So what we found from the Next Gen Traveler is, um, is that they don't use closets, they don't use drawers, they don't use desks. They like to sit in their beds with their laptops or their tablets. And um, uh, they don't want a bathtub, so you're going to see only showers. And um, you will, I think, be really surprised to see what's coming down the pike. As you already have seen, um, we have new great room lobbies, which are activated lobbies, because they don't travel like my generation or my father's generation, where we go up to our rooms and work and go to bed or have room service. They want to be in the lobbies. and form a community and work with everybody there. And so it's been really exciting because our lobbies used to just be a pass-through place for check-ins and check-outs, and now they're activated and busy, and you'll see lots of people in them, and we are really excited about that. Um, so the fourth challenge is, a new, is new leadership. And the reason why I say it's a challenge is, as you know, my father turned the reins over to Arnie Sorensen almost two years ago, and March will be his 82nd birthday when he turned 80. He, uh, he uh, left the CEO position, and um, my, but we're not allowed to use the R word around our family. My father is really not retired. He still visits two to 300 hotels a year, still holds his staff meetings, still writes about 500 thank you notes handwritten every year, um, and he still shows up at the office every day when he's in town. But for the first time in our 85-year history, we have a non-Marriott family member at the helm. So it's pretty incredible to think that in 85 years we've had two CEOs, my grandfather and my father. Um, and we're not really we're not worried about Arnie being the CEO, and I don't want to give you that impression. We think he's absolutely fabulous, and you saw him in the annual report video, and he, we think he's the best in the entire industry. And my dad's been grooming him for years, and we absolutely love him, and we're behind him 100 percent. But there are some people in the company that think that having a non-Marriott a non-family member at the helm um, could be a threat to our culture, and they worry a little bit. So um, as you know, some cultures are based on the icon or the guru, and Steve Jobs and Richard Branson come to mind when I think about that. And people always say, well, how are those organizations going to survive without them? In fact, a lot of our company culture can be summed up by what many people have told me where they are in a situation and they always think to themselves, well, what would Mr. Marriott do right now? And I'm representing the family when I make these decisions. And so that is a part of our culture. So there is a little bit of a threat to have a non-Marriott family member at the top. So I think that one of my jobs is to reassure our associates and our customers, our owners, and all of our stakeholders that the culture will remain the same and remain vibrant. Um, since it is our big, a big part of our identity, and it is, does give us our competitive advantage. Um, one of the things I will be doing is having Arnie make sure he goes into the back when he visits hotels and does hotel tours and has lunch in the associate cafeteria like my father did. Um, in 1957, we opened our first hotel, and you would pull up to this little booth that you see there uh, to check in. It was $8 a night for a room, and then they would count everybody in the car, and it was a dollar per person in your car. Then you'd follow the little bellman on the, on the bike to your room, and, uh, and it was all very easy and simple. But it's my job to make sure that our CEO and top executives follow me. I hope you can read that. The little sign says, follow me. <clears throat> when I see that we are falling short of living up to our core values. Part of my job is being the watchman, and the other part of my job is creating a culture of innovation and bringing new trends forward. It's become a huge company, but just making sure that our cultures and core values are on the radar will help keep this culture alive. Um, the last uh, challenge I want to talk to you about is that I feel like our general managers and our operators in the field are better keepers of the cultural flame than some of the people at corporate headquarters, and that worries me. There's becoming a wider and wider gap as our company gets bigger and bigger between the operators and 
the people at corporate headquarters. So if the culture fails at the top, we will start losing it in the field. Um, I want to elevate our operators and start closing that gap to keep our culture alive. Um, Dan wrote in his book that he has on this table, has a whole chapter on supporting your front lines. And that's one of the, the jobs that I really want to focus on, is supporting our front lines and elevating our wonderful operators. And I tell people at corporate all the time, and I tell our general managers this, if it weren't for you, our general managers, and all of the people that I see in the back of the room here lined up on the wall, we wouldn't be at corporate headquarters. So they're our most important people, and we need to take care of them. I have been so privileged to grow up in such a wonderful family where my father is my best friend and my mentor. It's an amazing American dream story. And I hope, and this is part of my job, that future generations will preserve the legacy and continue the hard work to provide an opportunity for all of our associates, our guests, and all of our stakeholders. Thank you very much.